So I want to welcome and give a really warm welcome to our colleagues from Finland who are wonderful uh, and accepted to come and talk to us about the Finnish context. Uh, but I think what they have to say is, uh, is uh, of broader relevance, obviously, as it all is with co-ops. So the first to talk to us is going to be Kari Huhtala, uh, and he will be addressing the supervisory boards in uh, cooperatives in Finland. And then the second one will be uh, Anupusa and uh, Sana, is it? Uh, she'll introduce herself when, when we get to that. So I'm passing the uh, torch to Kari and I'll stop sharing my slide. And Kari, if you have slides, please feel free to share. Thank you, Sonia. Okay. Good evening, good afternoon. My name is Kari Huhtela. I work as the Director of Cooperation at Pelero Coop Center, which is an APEX organization for Finnish cooperatives. Besides, I'm a doctoral student uh, at Lappeenranta LUT uh, University in Eastern Finland. And uh, my topic of my dissertation will be the election of board members in cooperatives. So, um, this presentation is actually um, uh, kind of like a spin-off from, from the main theme of my studies. Uh, we presented a conference paper um, jointly with uh, Mr. Ira Jussila uh, uh, about two years ago in Barcelona on this theme. And, uh, and this presentation is pretty much based on that paper. Uh, let's go ahead. Contents of my presentation will comprise what is a supervisory board, maybe is to be on the safe side and and to tell my perception of, of the supervisory board model, which is possibly not uh, familiar to all. And then second roles and context of supervisory board and, and use of authority in supervisory board, which is actually a case from our paper uh, regarding the selection of board members. What role does the supervisory board has in the Finnish context in this, in this very important process? Uh, for, former, we, where or some of the presentations we referred to uh, Mr. Beeman and his his paper where he says that most cooperatives around the world have some kind of supervisory board, although in some countries it is not mandated by the cooperative legislation. Um, in some countries it is called or it may be called the supervisor supervisory council, but they are they are basically synonyms to each other uh, in, in the literature. And, and usually the members of the supervisory board are elected by the General Assembly. And what is the main task of the supervisory board? According to Beeman, it is to monitor and control the board of directors on behalf of the General Assembly. This picture illustrates so-called internal tension within the governance of cooperative. I do not know if, if this terminology has been used widely, but this phenomenon is, is uh, familiar to all of us who work with or for cooperatives. Um, Bob Tricker, outside of the cooperative society, he quite exhaustively talks about two uh, needs: to need a need to conform and a need to perform. And also, Chris Confort uh, uh, on his or in his papers about uh, member-based uh, organizations talks about this these two perspectives: conformance and performance. And where do these two um, drivers stem from? First, this uh, performance 
this is quite self-evident. Performance requirement need stems from, from firm performance, that cooperative firm needs to perform, for instance, on the market. And sure, there are many other factors that, that influence firm performance, but this is, this is quite evident. And then on the other side, how about this conformance requirement? There are at least three types of, of uh, factors that, in, that are included. First, short-term and long-term expectations of the memberships, membership expectations of different subgroups within the memberships. Uh, and, and third, expectations of stakeholders around the member society membership, for instance, the local communities. And we can see that and understand that these expectations are quite dispersed or scattered. And the idea to manage is, is to uh, build up a functioning governance. In the literature, uh, there are mainly two or exist mainly or are presented mainly two types of governance structures. The one is so-called one-tire structure and, and, and the other one is two-tire governance structure. These are, I suppose, quite familiar to us. But now we, we come into this issue of and about the supervisory board. First, um, um, if you think about this performance function, uh, how is it taken care of in, in cooperatives? If we have one tire structure, so it is the board that takes care of the performance function, but as well in the two tire model, it is the board of directors that takes care of the performance. But then if you have a supervisory board, what is the difference between these two models? So still in the leftmost model, uh, it is the board of directors, directors that takes care of the conformance requirement as well. But in two tire structure, it is the supervisory board that is able to now take a role in this conformance function. And so we can see that the division of labor is different in these two types of models. And this, this is very important when you think about the role of the supervisory board. The supervisory board has been like, uh, its importance have, has been belittled in, in recent years and, uh, and decades pretty much. And many cooperatives even have removed the supervisory board from, from the structure. But um, we claim and maintain in our paper that the supervisory board can have an essential role in the governance. And in this picture, uh, we can see uh, the whole governance model uh, in, in its widest, widest um, version where we have a member council or, or, or council of delegates supervisory board and the board of directors. Where we see that in the membership, there exist uh, all types of emotions, will, expectations, and to control, need to control. But on the right side, the board of directors take care of the consideration, action, performance. And here in the middle is the supervisory board, which usually uh, consists of, of its members consist of, um, of, of the members of that cooperative. What can it do besides to control, which is the legal function? Uh, first, uh, it can be at the best member owner's voice in, in a cooperative. And in that sense, steer uh, the cooperative onwards. But also the supervisory board uh, 
at the best is able to function as an intermediator uh, within the governance between the board and the membership. I call it here internal communication into both directions. In this sense, it can take a big role. In the Finnish model, uh, uh, in the Cooperative Act, the supervisory board has quite a big uh, power. It has, it has an authority to both appoint and resign the board of directors and to control it. For instance, in, 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 in the Netherlands, where they commonly have a supervisory board model, it doesn't, um, it doesn't appoint the, the board of directors because it belongs to the General Assembly. So it depends on, on the legislation, how much power the supervisory board has. In the Finnish model, the power is quite big. And while uh, Mr. Hansman maintains that, that the control is important, which it, which it really is, we would add up in our study that the supervisory board can have not only legitimate power, but also many, many other types of uh, authority and an influence on, on um, the governance, especially to, towards the board. And this is the final uh, page and picture which summarizes uh, some observation, preliminary observations from our paper. So uh, please, uh, please uh, regard that, that this was on the selection of board members. But we can see that on the leftmost side where we have, or in this picture we have, um, we have compared uh, our results against uh, against uh, Raven uh, Raven's um, social social theory uh, on on different types of powers. So we can see that um, that the supervisory board can have several types of authority or power within the government, not only the legitimate power, which is a default, but also coercive power, for instance, to, to, uh, to dismiss uh, the board of directors if it is necessary. But also the supervisory board chair, what we realized, it was, this was a qualitative study. We realized that the chair is a very influential having informational power and even referent power, which re refers to refers to his his or her um, his or her um, personal per attractiveness or, or respect. So um, in conclusion and, and, and in some in some um, we see that supervisory board uh, may have a central role and uh, contribute to, to the governance praxis within cooperatives, even though it is not ne necessarily used sufficiently uh, these days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kari, for a very timely presentation. Uh, thank you and informative. Um, I'm sure there will be others interested in this uh, idea of supervisory boards and their usefulness or their role. Uh, so we'll hear more about those. But first, let's go to the second paper in this section. And I am told that it is a collaborative effort between Anupusa and Sanna uh, Sastamoinen. I hope I'm saying it right. And that Sasta is, Sanna is going to be presenting uh, the paper. We will so, be presenting it together. Sorry? We will be presenting it together. She's just uh, sharing. Oh, excellent. Okay, Anu, thank you. So take it away and introduce yourselves and we're listening. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. And thank you, Karen and Sonia and everyone else for making this happen. It's a very important 
uh, symposium to get together and talk about these important issues. Our topic talks about cooperative governance and also these uh, governance uh, roles, role ambiguity, and, and whether or not they are actually democratic. And uh, my name is Anu Pusa. I work as a professor at the University of Eastern Finland. And my colleague here is Sanna Saastamoinen. Sanna, you want to say a few words about yourself? Hello. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm Sanna and I'm a doctoral student in the in, uh, same university, so University of Eastern Finland. All right, and we'll go ahead. Uh, this is a working progress. It's a case study concerning a consumer cooperative in Finland. And as you know, we have talked about it a lot today. Cooperatives differ from other forms of organization due to their unique purpose and especially the nature of the member engagement. And, th and that's why the democratic governance structure is one of the most distinctive feature of a cooperative. And, and, and it's so different and wonderful because the members are playing a, such a significant part in the decision-making, at, at least in theory. And our case explores whether or not or to which extent this is actually true. Uh, the ultimate idea of the whole model, governance model, is that the membership of the cooperative should be actively involved in the decision uh, making. And as you know, each member has the opportunity to apply for positions of trust through elections. And all of the governance bodies have a very distinctive role and duties in a cooperative governance system as a whole. And uh, like Kari explained, the whole system in Finland comprised of general members meeting, which is the ultimate decision making forum in a cooperative and a supervisory board, a board of directors and a CEO. And in, in large cooperatives, like in our case cooperative, we use, use uh, this um, uh, representative uh, council and they, they uh, elect the supervisory board members. And as for the tasks, Kari somewhat explained, but very briefly, just to clarify, the Council of Representatives decides on the members of the supervisory board, also on the audits, and they decide uh, if, any, uh, if there is any surplus, how it will be used. They, uh, they approve the financial statements, decide, um, uh, examine, uh, the accounts on annual basis and decide on the approval of the accounts and the discharge. These kind of things and some other important tasks, whereas the, the primary and most important task of the supervisory board is to ensure that the board of directors and the CEO act in accordance with the cooperative act and the cooperative rule, basically fulfill the mission of the cooperative. Um, a few words about why we are doing this kind of research. So, Sanna, go ahead. Thank you, Anu. <clears throat> Most studies of cooperatives have been conducted uh, using neoclassically inspired economic models uh, that take into account the characters and behavior of capitalist firms and tay owners, uh, thus failing to take into account a wide uh, range of criteria motivating the establishment of <clears throat> cooperatives. Uh, the role of cooperatives governing body has been found to be more uh, demanding and presents uh, more challenges than is the case with investor-owned firms. At the same time, uh, the management of cooperatives is described in the uh, frameworks of uh, corporate governance theories with Overall, the different specific nature and different of uh, governance structure of cooperatives. Uh, humanistic uh, theories of economics and management better capture the logic uh, behind the cooperative organization than neoclassical and neo institutional theories, which rely on a rational economic man and his or her self-interest. Theories which based on the human conception of the economic man do not take into account the specific features of uh, cooperatives that emerge from this conception of the human, like 
co-ownership, democracy and the purpose of optimizing membership benefits. The humanistic conception of human being and the theories of leadership and management which built on it are therefore better suited to the cooperative context. From the perspective of the humanistic paradigm, it has been argued that cooperative governance should be a network governance with a network-like structure and where power is shared to a wide range of members and stakeholders. The division of power ensures the implementations of the principles of democracy and uh, co-ownership. When power is divided in the network, it's important that everyone who is involved uh, in the governance recognize the purpose of each governing bodies, as well as the tasks of the team and the basic idea on which the cooperative governance is based. Uh, previous research uh, shows that widespread ownership of large consumer pro, uh, cooperatives can lead to the passivation and alienation of members. So the role of the governing bodies is even more important to uh, realization of the idea uh, of the cooperative. Most governance uh, research has focused uh, on the role and structure uh, of, uh, of the board of directors uh, and research is needed because of the different types of companies and their impact uh, on the governance system. And there's uh, only a little previous research on supervised boards and councils of representatives. Please, Anu. Because basically, our research contributes to the discussion related to the features and especially the challenges facing this participatory, people-centered and democratic gover and cooperative governance. And basically what we are doing, we have a qualitative case study and, and we are interested on the roles and tasks and responsibilities of the various uh, governing uh, bodies. And here are our uh, research questions basically how they understand the whole and, and how, what do they feel they are deciding on. And when they describe the, the responsibilities and tasks, we interpret how these ideas reflect this humanistic approach of cooperative uh, governance. Uh, we have, like I said, qualitative uh, data. We have a sample of 54 uh, participants and we used qualitative content analysis uh, to go through the data and then we'll go straight to the uh, empirical findings. We'll be very brief with that. Uh, <clears throat> so the responses of the informants, the informants were very uh, heterogeneous uh, and perception of the roles and tasks of different governing bodies were fragmented. Uh, it appears uh, that for the majority of the governing members, the overall uh, structure of the governing body and the tasks of the various governing bodies are not clear. In practice, the majors present a view of the cooperative as a very hierarchical actor in which the different governing bodies are seen to operate hierarchical re relationship with, uh, with each other and cooperation and interaction and communication between them is limited and uh, in which real power is exercised by very few. The rep representative council, which is mentioned as high, highest uh, decision-making body of the governing <coughs> governance is not interpreted by its members as an actual decision-making body at all. Its most important and practical task seems to culminate to communication of members' issues. Thus, uh, the decision-making power of the representative council was perceived mainly as a rhetorical mantra uh, to 
the absence of which does not in fact support the perception of the cooperative as a genuinely democratic form of enterprise uh, that listens to the voice of uh, its members at and meets their uh, needs. The research uh, were also researchers were also asked to consider how decision making take, takes place in general terms. In the answer is that the cooperative principles are considered important and the principle of democracy. Dan, we seem to be having trouble hearing you. It's just started to cut out just recently. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's other noise or if you have a headset there though. We'll try it again though, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so to answer so that the cooperative principles are considered important and the principle of uh, democracy is strongly uh, emphasized in regard to this question. However, its content does not appear to be clear to all members of the governing bodies. From the answers, we cannot see how democracy is realized in practice. So uh, its value tab um, is strongly associated with the cooperative idea, but which in, it, which in practice, practice is not expected to be realized. On the basis uh, of the data, democracy is considered to be a part of a cooperative, but everybody <clears throat> assumes its unrealizable character without questions. Uh, in practice, people don't worry that democracy may not be realized. In other words, the democratic nature of the cooperative was only emphasized on the paper so the decision making seems to be very CDU democratic. As a sub team, we also explored the motives of governance re representatives to become and act as a re representative. Uh, these motives varied from selfies to very altruistic, which uh, in part helps to explain our conclusions. Wonderful. Thank you, Sanna. And we'll move on to the discussion. So basically, I'm going to highlight the, the main points. Uh, you can move on to the, to the next one. So basically, uh, as we heard, the democracy is a value uh, that is very in, in the cooperative thinking and idea. And it's, it's really uh, the key characteristic of cooperatives. It's really the heart and soul, as it, it stated in the ICA uh, identity statement. Uh, and our uh, re uh, respondents also highlighted its, its importance. However, it, our material le lead us to ask, how do the members understand or what, the, what do they ultimately mean when they talk about democracy? Because it shows that in practice, it's, it, it is realized only as a cooperative member's right to stand for election and be elected to the governance. However, uh, democracy is about more than elections. It's about how, how these elected leaders make decisions that is about governance and uh, decision-making systems. So the focus should be actually on the quality of the democracy, how the, the, the decision-making works and if the governance system is, is meeting its uh, full uh, potential. And in our case, like, like it's, uh, we describe, it seems that it's basically this representative council is a rubber stamp with no real power. They are there, but they don't really decide on many things. And secondly, our data leads us to conclusion that the power is very concentrated in a case cooperative. The decision-making power of the board of representatives is it's really reduced to a very passive listening of the supervisory board. There's no actual uh, dialogue. 
and, and the supervisory board, in turn, they don't recognize or really describe the object or the scope of their oversight role, who or what are they supervising. So that concentrates power uh, to the board of direct directors and operational uh, management. And all this conflicts with the views of humanistic governance. Uh, and thirdly, uh, we talked about this, uh, the hierarchical relationship between uh, these uh, governance bodies. And, and basically, uh, we also question why these people, even though they say that we are motivated to do the tasks and represent the voice of the members, but they are surprisingly satisfied with the current situation. They don't uh, question the lack of influence and they don't really criticize it. And finally, our fourth conclusion is that basically, um, and this is our major concern, it, uh, who is actually supervising the board of directors, uh, directors and the management if the members of the supervisory board do, don't, do not even recognize their most important task, their role as a supervisor. So basically their concrete decision-making power seemed to culminate in choosing the CEO and the members of the board. So these kind of concerns, and like we said, this is still a work in progress and we very much uh, appreciate all the comments, comments and questions from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm coming, I'm making it, all right. <laughs> okay, so we are in the university where people are starting to show up. And so we have noises from all over, kind of shut the doors. Anyway, thank you so much. This was really informative as it was depressing, uh, but uh, <laughs> let's hear some comments and, uh, and input. Uh, I mean, Kari, if you want to take it away, uh, please do, but I'm not putting you on the spot. It's just that you know the situation in the country, so maybe there's something that you'd like to add to this. Uh, or if not, no worries. Uh, I'm just curious to see if people have any thoughts, any concerns, like uh, whatever you, you want to share. Yeah, thank you. Um, Anderson, Sanna's uh, research is, is extremely interesting. And uh, maybe a few comments um, about that power element. Um, which I've been like researching as well. Uh, my my like uh, object group of research are producers cooperatives. So and when some are investigating consumers cooperatives. So uh, there are there are like common st the structures are common, but 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 the field uh, is 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 different. But um, I would say that. The role of the supervisory board and its its power is um, is both good and bad <laughs> because um, in my research uh, it it I, I realized that it was good that the supervisory board and its chair has has quite much power because um, it is it is an intermediator between the membership it has an an optimal position towards the membership to listen sensitively what the membership or the member council is is saying, and then to supervise uh, the board. For, this, for instance, in the Finnish model, the supervisor board chair attends all board meetings, uh, hundred percent. So the chair is quite pretty much aware of what all is happening, but. Um, on the other hand, I realized uh, uh, within the producer cooperatives that the supervisor board chair may become kind of super person with, with an overwhelming authority and power is, is uh, sitting on the board of directors, is, is, is sitting as the chair of the nomination committee, which prepares the election of board members and uh, is leading the supervisory board. They in, um, informally discussed those chairs, supervisor board chair and the board chair. And 
they informally uh, discuss quite much uh, career discussions uh, back of the scenes. Uh, so very influential person, which is, which requires very high moral in order to uh, be uh, be uh, functional and uh, and and work. But uh, the bad side, negative side, may be that that this role becomes too strong and. Uh, concentrated as we heard and that is that may dilute the role of the membership that was my my actually the main comment All right thank you very much um other thoughts um any comments sonia there is a question from olive mccarthy as well okay olive go ahead Hi there, and uh, hello from Ireland. I really enjoyed both of your papers. Thank you, Carrie and Anu. And I have a question for both of you, but it's similar questions, but maybe a little bit different as well. Uh, but just for um, Carrie, I was wondering um, in terms of resources for supervisory committees. So is there, um, so say in the Irish context where you have the board and the supervisory committee, the supervisory committee needs to, um, um, get its resources from the board. So even though it, it, there's oversight of the board by the supervisory committee, the board still sanctions the resources that the supervisory committee gets. So it's a very strange kind of a, a dependency, I suppose, of the supervisory committee on the board and vice versa. So that was just my question for Carrie and for Anu and um, her, um, her colleague. I just wanted to ask about, because um, this is a little piece of work that I'm just doing myself at the moment, which is around the remuneration of the board. So just wondering if directors get paid and if there's any relationship between the various things that you've been looking at and being paid or not paid. Thank you. If I'll if I'll go first, your question was if, if they were paid. Yes, they are. Yes, they get a monthly salary and also they get some sum for each meeting. So yes, there is this monetary relationship too. That was quite interesting. That was a good question, uh, uh, considering those resources and those the the roles between the board and the supervisory board uh, i'm not sure i do not know your legislation but it might be so that the supervisory board does not uh, nominate appoint the board of directors is it so uh, or yes, just... the members the members will elect in the case where the members, members elect the supervisory committee yes yeah but uh, but like in the Finnish context, so the supervisory board has has a full power over the board of directors. It both monitors, and it is based on the Cooperative Act, monitors and uh, and uh, nominates uh, the directors uh, on the board of directors. So the board of directors uh, does not have any authority over the supervisory board. So we have not realized that it, this could, would be any problem, but but if the supervisory board does, doesn't does have that much power in your country, so it, it might be a bit controversial, this, this relationship. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 